Thank you very much indeed for the invitation to talk. And again, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm very grateful to all the organisers there. I know I've been working with a lot of people uh, on the working group on valparation. It's good to see people from so many disciplines coming together to try and help families who have to deal with fetal valparate syndrome. I've forgotten my conflict of interest slide. However, what I can tell you is that I have lots of conflicts, but none of them is interesting. <laughs> However, I don't do private practice and I haven't any particular relationships with pharmaceutical companies involved in prescribing anticonvulsants. One of the questions I first got asked by my medical colleagues to say, why are you actually doing this? What are the clinical geneticists doing with something that isn't genetic? And actually, it's because clinical geneticists are trained as specialists in identifying people with unusual, rare congenital anomalies and developmental disorders of many types, often with later onset intellectual disability, and also have an expertise in rare disorders. So we're asked to see many children who have a wide range of developmental disorders and congenital anomalies, many of which may be genetic, but also because of that expertise, we're in a position to be able to make a diagnosis for rare diseases, and that would include um, fetal valparate syndrome, um, and, and our paediatrician colleagues would look to us for the, that expertise. So there's no conflict there. Um, just in terms of the history, I'm going to go through some of it, and again, it's reiterating some of the points but, uh, that all others have made. I want to just highlight, highlight a couple of things, though. It obviously had been around since the uh, late 60s in terms of treatment for epilepsy. It was first licensed for use here in 1975. Uh, and in terms of the medical information that was concerned about risks to fetuses exposed to valparate, by case reports first. And this was again back in the early 80s. Um, and again, the first that came up was spina bifida, or neural tube defects. Uh, and, and in fact, the first more than single case report came from France in the Rhone Alp, from Robert, uh, actually near Grenoble, where the first um, drug was actually prepared, showing that there was a significant no a number of children born with spina bifida and mothers who were on valparaise. And actually in the US, the Centre for Disease Control noted that in 1983 and, and had published a short notification saying that valparaise is a new cause for birth defects, quoting a 1-2% to risk of spina bifida. That's 1983. Um, and then there was a Dutch and German group in the 80s, Lintar Schmidt, and again who've been involved in this a lot further on over the last 20 years, uh, doing a prospective study and again showing that there was increased risk of spina bifida. And at that stage, what knowledge was being said, and I'm not sure it was necessarily correct, was yes, we know there's a problem with spina bifida, but that should be it. And clearly that was not accurate. And because it was clear that other malformations were also happening in children who were exposed to sodium valparation, and again, a German group later on showed malformations in a small number of children born to mothers on valparate. There was Italian studies, and then there was much bigger 97 European studies. But that took 11, 12 years to be able to get that information together, showing that there was increased risk of multiple congenital anomalies, up to six times more controls, which was highest for those who were over 1,000 milligrams, and it was dose-dependent, and it was also related to polypharm not polypharmacy, but people who needed to be on more than one anticonvulsant also had a higher chance of having a child with a congenital malformation. The actual term fetal valparate syndrome, as, as Peter has referred to, uh, first came around in 1984 from a group uh, called De Liberty, which actually was a kind of a set of um, both American and UK people who described seven children who had a facial appearance that was characteristic with developmental delay. Uh, and then there was a subsequent series of case reports thereafter. But the actual review, which was actually very useful, was by Jill Clayton Smith. And, and I know Peter and Jill have been working on uh, fetal valparate syndrome for the last 30 years, effectively, in, in the UK, along with uh, Diane Donai from Manchester. Uh, and I'm just showing you some of the pictures. These are old black and white ones of people with uh, valparate syndrome. And again, you can see on the left the typical features of a child with fetal valparate. Uh, again, medical terms, trigonocephaly, um, that actually means triangle-shaped head in Greek. Um, but essentially, you've got people with a very prominent, if you look at them from the top, it looks like a, a, a triangle with a very prominent uh, bone there, which is called a hematopic suture. And you get these extra infraorbital creases along the under part of the eyes. And again, there's an older child with a similar condition uh, appearance. And again, you can see the thin upper lip in that child. And again, the very broad noose. So the, the, the top of the eyebrows seem to be very far apart. And, and then the child on the right is a, a baby, uh, a rather a girl, who is actually her, the radius, which is one of the bigger bones in your forearms, hasn't developed. So her wrists are turned in. And often, with association with that, people are missing thumbs. And that's clearly a, clearly a serious anomaly as part of uh, fetal valparate syndrome. And these are the kind of features that were described, and actually they're very similar to what Peter has already talked about. I'm not going to go through them again. Some of them are 
um, written descriptions of what often is a visual appearance. Uh, and again, one of the things that clinical geneticists are trained to do is, to, is a pattern recognition exercise. If you're able to go and look at particular patterns and identify them on a regular basis, and you've seen enough of them, it makes it a lot easier to diagnosis. So often there would be annual meetings for clinical geneticists where people sit down and describe patterns, and other clinicians who are also geneticists share the same experience. So to try and broaden people's understanding of these conditions. And then there's a, a significant list of congenital malformations on the right. And obviously that's a much more extended list now compared to what was described in 1995. <clears throat> um, and these are Peter and uh, John Dean's dead, uh, diagnostic criteria from the paper you published uh, quite some time ago on the diagnostic criteria for antivirals. And obviously this is being updated by the new proposals which from the UK, which again I think we're likely to adopt in our service. And there are a presence of a particular characteristic facial appearance and evidence of the, the woman being on the drug definitely taking it on valparation, the compatible malformations, medical problems, developmental history, and, and again, excluding alternative possibilities, carry chromosome analysis, microarray, fragile X. Uh, the picture on the right there is actually um, a composite. It's actually a picture of about 30 or 40 people with uh, fetal valparate syndrome that's just been laid over and, and seamed together to try and get a characteristic. It's from a, an American um, group called Face2Gene, who've actually used the uh, facial recognition technology that was actually first developed by Mossad for identifying Palestinians crossing into Israel, uh, and then used the same technology to be able to take people with unusual facial features and then synthesize those into particular conditions. And that can sometimes be a help in terms of recognizing the features. And you can see quite a lot of the characteristic features there. Um, so again, uh, that's using technology to try and make better information and better diagnoses. Trying to determine the true effects has taken far too long, um, and a lot of the themes that I've already heard, uh, and you would all heard about how, why it's taken so long, why was it so long for the information to get there. Some of it may, may relate to the fact that we currently have a much more rapid way of sharing information than would have been around 25 years ago. That's not an excuse. Um, but, <laughs> sorry? Um, but also, that uh, there's been development of registries, both for women who've been on epilepsy, and those registries have been developed um, in many different countries in large numbers to be able to study this. So that, but that's taken a lot of work to do that so that you can get better information to, for families. And also congenital malformation registers. Uh, for instance, this is a malformation paper from uh, the European congenital malformation, including Helen Dalk, who's one of the major drivers from, from the UK and Northern Ireland. Uh, and they quoted uh, an significant increased risk for six different malformations based on the data they had from across a huge number of European registries of children born with physical abnormalities, um, including things like spina bifida, uh, cleft palate, congenital heart disease. Hypospadias, that's where a boy in his penis, normally the, the, the urethra where he pees out of is at the very tip of the penis. In the hypospadias, it's actually on the underside, which actually makes it very difficult for the boy dealing with that and usually requires significant surgical operations. And actually increased risk of having additional digits was one of the things which is called polydactyly. Uh, and then the registers, many have developed, and, and one of the big issues that has also been able to do is the whole ability to do systematic reviews. Uh, and I'm just going to touch on two of them, both of which is this Cochrane review, which is a structured way of trying to review data st studies of sufficient quality in numbers to be able to make, make inferences. And the Cochrane review, uh, which was done by a group from the UK, including Jill Clayton Smith, looked at 50 studies uh, which looked prospectively at malformations of pregnancy exposed to anticonvulsants, and they quote, and it was a very reliable uh, rate at this stage, of 10.9% congenital malformation for, um, for ch uh, pregnancies exposed to sodium valparate. Um, and that's a 355-page document if anybody wants to read it, but you probably just need to get the bottom line at the moment and read it later. The same group uh, then also looked specifically at developmental disorders, without going to the kind of detail that Peter has talked about in terms of the variety of developmental disorders. Again, 28 studies, so it's a smaller group, but again, large numbers of pregnancies exposed, and found that there was a, a significant drop in IQ of children born to mothers on Valparais, uh, and even compared to those children who are mothers who had epilepsy that weren't in the end medication, um, by an average of between 8 and 12 IQ points. I think that actually doesn't tell you enough, because actually there's many more developmental problems that go rather than just simply saying it's a drop in IQ, uh, because there's a huge range within that, and there are many other developmental issues that are not picked up purely by IQ tests. Um, and the Canadian Review quoted a 40% risk of uh, developmental disorders, again, in a broad way. So it's clear that that information is there. In terms of our own experience, um, first of all, this is Harry, a number of you have met him outside, and I'm very grateful to both Harry and Karen for letting me use a photograph of Harry. This is him quite some time ago. He's uh, a lot older now. Um, and we look back at uh, children that have been seen through our service with the diagnosis of fetal valparate syndrome over the last, well, I suppose, 20 years. Um, 
And again, we used Peter and uh, John's criteria. Uh, and we found the commonly uh, features, the prominent topic ridge, the broad uh, nasal root, which is again the gap between your eyebrows, epicanthic folds, particularly those creases underneath your eyes are very characteristic. Some children had small chins and then the broad and flat nasal bridge. And again, we found that there was a significant number of malformations and uh, neurotube defects were had in those three of them. And again, I'm not saying this is any way representative of all of the Irish children. Um, congenital heart disease, limb defects, and again, serious developmental problems in just over half of the children, speech delay, neurodevelopmental disorders, intellectual disability in the older children. And, and the point we were trying to make for the Irish population is to highlight the fact that even though this is something that we've been known about for a long time, um, that we're still seeing it in the Irish population. Now, I don't believe that this is any different from any other population. There's nothing specific about Ireland that makes us better or worse. And also, these 29 children are not in any way very representative of all of the children and people who've had fetal valve syndrome. There are many more out there. But as part of the response to trying to deal with that, um, the HSE has been put together a working group, and I'm not going to go through all of it, but I just want to take a couple of points that have come from the working group in terms of recommendations and other actions that have been done. Um, Sorry, the other point I should make is that in terms of its use, not all the children that we saw were on, their mothers were on um, anticonvulsants because of epilepsy. A number of them were on children's, uh, on uh, Valkyrie because they're on a mood stabiliser, separate to use in epilepsy. And there is an issue of education, both in terms of the psychiatrist and also those involved in mental health nursing to be aware of the risk of sodium valproate. And some of the people I've seen were actually on lithium as a drug and were moved from lithium because lithium was known to cause damage to a baby in the developing the womb. And then they went to Valparaiso and a baby with an anomaly as a result. So that's not helpful. So again, there's an educational point in relation to that. Um, and so the risk of the interactionicity is regardless of whether you've been treated for uh, a bipolar or manic depressive disorder or whether you've been treated for epilepsy, the risk remains the same. How does it cause it? We've talked about um, histone deacetylase inhibitors. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that, Peter and, and, and Dr. Nathan Jeff have already talked about histone acetylase inhibitors, but essentially this is a way of the drug interfering the way in which normal genes are regulated and whether they're switched in, on and off. And clearly, um, uh, in normal human development in the womb, it's critical that particular genes are switched on or off at particular stages in our development to allow development of the palate, of the heart and of the brain and many other organs. And if you can disrupt that uh, balance of gene transcription using histone or deacetylase inhibitors, that can potentially have problems. And there are animal studies showing, done in actually zebrafish of all things, which have shown using valproate as a histone deacetylase inhibitor can interfere with normal brain development in the fish. In terms of what's going on in Ireland, um, this is work that's been done as part of the working group, and I'm very grateful to Ronan Glynn, who did all this work, and I'm not going to take any credit for it, but he did a really good work. Ronan is a Deputy Chief Medical Officer with the Department of Health, and did a lot of work looking back at the number of women likely to have been prescribed sodium valproate, comparing to the number of births and the number of women who were at a, a childbearing age, uh, and came up with these figures, which are on the right, based on birth date over the last 40 years. Um, in suggesting that um, there are probably uh, up to about 43 to 95 people born at that stage who have had some form of congenital malformation after 2000, but others going back to 75, there could be up to 340. And if you want to look at the, from 1975 onwards, there are probably about 1,200 people potentially exposed. So the scale of this is nothing compared to what we just described, which is 29 people I've told you about. Um, uh, and so there are potentially people out there who may well have this condition, and a number of them may not know that. Uh, these are estimates. These are not actual figures. They are theoretical estimates. It's not that anybody has been actually counted. But Ronan has done a very helpful job in trying to work that out. So the HSE response, and again, I'm, you will hear more about it in the afternoon, is that there's been a multidisciplinary working group. And actually, working groups that actually work together was good, because I've been on working groups that don't work together. Um, this one very clearly does, with a very clear goal. Um, and it was about prevention, I'm not going to talk about that, but also care for those diagnosed and providing diagnostic pathways, not for those necessarily who have already been diagnosed, because if your child is already diagnosed, you don't need to go back around the diagnostic pathway, uh, but for those where there is already a suspicion. Um, uh, and one of the problems with this is that the clinical geneticists are the people to do it. This is currently the number of clinical geneticists per million of the population across various countries in Europe. Uh, the arrow is slightly wrong on it because we're actually at the bottom left corner. Um, <laughs> there's four of us at the moment. Um, the HSE had thankfully a funded uh, consultant to help deal with this work because currently we're very stretched and our routine, routine waiting lists are between two and a half, three years for people to be seen. Um, and that's not something, anything that I would like, be happy to stand over, but that's the problem, so we need to try and deal with that. 
Uh, you can look at all your other things. Malta and Finland do very well. Uh, and so we've also tried to set up a, a proposed way, a pathway for GPs and for paediatricians and specialists in terms of concern about people who have fetal valparate syndrome. And if there's a concern about a child having fetal valparate syndrome, then GPs can refer to a consultant paediatrician. And in fact, Dr. Kalim, who actually has had to leave because she's going back to do her clinic in Cromwell, but she was here this morning, uh, has been appointed to see children with um, yeah, a suspected valparate syndrome as a paediatrician in Cromwell. And that's not just for children within the small Dublin catchment area. Um, and then also, in terms of helping with that diagnosis, with those children can then be seen by the clinical genetics. Uh, but there are also adults who uh, may well have been exposed and have problems, and they can be referred directly by their GP to the genetic service, and we can provide they're notified that that's the case. And, and then we can see them and try and help to make a diagnosis using the criteria that Peter talked about, obviously adding in the newer criteria that develop, going through the pregnancy history of the, the number of anti-epileptic drugs and so on, the history of both of the newborn growth and development, family history, looking for signs of, fat, of fetal valparate syndrome, or potentially an alternative diagnosis, and also uh, often it's really helpful to review previous medical and developmental records. And I should have mentioned, as Peter did, also to review the old photographs of somebody who's 15, looking what they were like, weren't there two or three? That can also make a huge deal of difference. Uh, and then at the end of all that, you can you, you try and get a clinical summary, and you've excluded other possible causes of developmental delay and congenital malformations, and done chromosome testing, and usually testing for fragile X. If there is a suspected alternative single gene disorder, we can test for it. And certainly, we'll be moving towards testing for alterations in the 7,000 known disease-related genes, which is called clinical exome, as a way of trying to exclude any basis. And then we'll see them back when the information is complete. And people will then get an outcome of either getting a diagnosis of fetal valparate syndrome confirmed by exclusion. Alternatively, there may be another diagnosis. Alternatively, there may be an uncertainty about whether you can make the diagnosis or not. And often, we may look to get further opinions. And there also will be children who have been exposed, who are actually perfectly well, who have no developmental problems, who have no signs of the condition. It doesn't automatically mean that, that they necessarily have it. Um, and so this would be a pathway. One of the things is that we've, I've already been discussing with um, Jill in Manchester to be kind of sharing, not patient information, but the structures and how we deliver clinics so that often we'd be relating to our UK colleagues who are obviously in the same process of dealing with this to have a specialist way of trying to make these diagnoses rather than just flying it as a solo Irish one and also linked with the European reference networks that um, Jill has already, uh, Peter has already talked about. So, so that's a view from Ireland. We're not there by any means. There's a lot of work to be done, and it's clearly as big a problem here, if not as many others. And it's also clearly an underestimated problem here, as it has been many others in terms of making the diagnosis. But we're certainly keen to very try and much help. Okay, thank you.